All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to Poppy Hour, our monthly conversation about California native plants. Uh, my name is Erin, and I am the outreach manager at Theodore Payne Foundation uh, for wildflowers and native plants. And I'm joined today by my amazing co-host, Brenda Kyle, who is our community engagement coordinator. Hey, Brenda. Hi, Erin. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> How lucky. How lucky are we to have our guest for today of all days. I know. It couldn't I have know. worked out better in, unless we planned it. Who else has <laughs> local NASA engineer friends? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and we also have Scott Share, our adult education manager, uh, who is behind the scenes Zoom directing. Hey, Scott. Hey, everyone. He's there. Oh. <laughs> Awesome. So today is Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. We are going to be um, talking about global warming today, um, as as we just uh, mentioned with our local NASA engineers um, from the Jet Propulsion Lab. So um, we're going to be talking about how this impacts uh, us globally, as well as really locally here in Southern California, and also how it impacts California native plants. And so we're really excited to have them here today. And we're gonna open uh, with a plant today, a California icon, the Majestic Coast Live Oak. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And of course, I know you all know what a Coast Live Oak looks like, um, but I'm gonna go to view, enter full screen. But they are truly majestic. This oak here is probably around 200 years old. And in addition to sequestering your carbon, uh, this tree is also providing shade and beauty, uh, as well as food and shelter for literally thousands of uh, our creatures, local wildlife, um, and including a creature. I learned about today, I was doing a little uh, brushing up on fun facts in one of our absolute favorite books, California Native Plants for the Garden. And I learned this is home to the nocturnal arboreal salamander. So uh, keep an eye out for that guy at night when you're visiting the oak trees at night. Um, but it's truly amazing how many species these are, uh, wildlife species these trees support. Um, and I, if anybody was able to tune into our garden tour last weekend, this uh, photograph was actually taken at one of the gardens featured on the tour uh, in Highland Park, um, LA native um, plant source. And it's an incredible garden. If you missed it and want to catch it, um, we are, have it up online at the store right now. So you can purchase the 10 hours of online content. It was, it was really a marathon. So um, check it out. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention about that tour is that the feature presentation was by Professor uh, Douglas Ptolemy, who is an entomologist working on the East Coast. And he does a lot of research about native plants and their interactions with our local ecosystems. And he just published this book all about oak trees. It's called the nature of oaks. And I just wanted to read you a quote from the very beginning. So I think it really um, sets the stage for how important this is. So oaks support more forms of life and more fascinating interactions than any other tree genus in North America. All this life does not show up at the same time nor stay with your oak the entire year. Some species in fact are so ephemeral you need to be on hand the single day they visit your tree. To fully appreciate what an oak tree can bring to your yard and into your life, if you are willing, we will need to follow what is happening on your oak trees month by month through all four seasons, which he does in this book, starting with October, and is also the theme of our garden tour this year. So we have footage from the spring um, and winter, and we'll be going back in the fall to collect more, um, more footage of these gardens and how they change through the seasons. And so they're, they're truly um, incredible wonders that live here with us. 
Uh, and they also perform another really important um, service connected to global warming, um, which is they can also help protect your home from wildfires. And for those of you who might be living um, at the edge of the urban wildland interface, um, many of the homes that burn here in Southern California actually don't catch fire from a fire engulfing uh, the home. They catch fire because of the embers from those fires that often can fly up to a mile ahead. And so these trees can actually act um, as kind of a, a screen or a, a catcher's mitt. And because they're evergreen, um, extinguish some of those embers that are flying through the air, protecting your home from, from that ignition. So um, they are a, a wonderful tree that um, can help in many, many ways. Um, and so with that, if you are just now tuning in, welcome to season two, episode eight of Poppy Hour. Um, we are going to start the presentation soon. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please pop them into the chat. Um, we usually have a very vigorous conversation going there. And then at the end, we'll be able to uh, field some of those questions to our, our guests tonight. So um, many, many thanks to our anonymous donor who has made um, season two of Poppy Hour possible. And with that, I will turn it over to Brenda. And there's trees in the sales yard. <laughs> and there they are. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Hey, Brenda. Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much. Um, what, what is there that a tree can't do? All right, so we'll, we'll start with the land acknowledgement. I am here on Wikadna, home of the Wikanbitam. This is the place of thorns. We acknowledge our neighbors in all directions, the Shumash, the Tataviam, the Katunamuk, Luceño Serrano, and Thank you all for joining us today. And as Aaron said, a um, little bit different. We're not going to have a back and forth conversation today. It's going to be a presentation from Robert Hogg, JPL, who is a Stanford trained physicist, been with JPL for 25 years, um, and is currently working on uh, soil samples from Mars. Uh, well, want to hear about that? Mars dirt. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> And Robert Clem, who has worked with uh, TPF on many occasions doing different gardens. He labels himself an instigator. And I can say, yeah, he starts it. Uh, <laughs> we'll hear um, from more from them later. So again, if, feel free to put comments in the chat. There will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, but feel free also to put your questions in the Q&A tab that you can find on the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, um, Robert, let's start with you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Earth Day. Uh, very thrilled to be with you today. So I am, and uh, uh, I'm, so I'm Robert, and our- And I'm Roger. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> and so let's just uh, share our screen here. Okay, is that, sh and then uh, full screen. How's that? That's okay. perfect. Good, we see that. Wonderful. Okay, so um, let me just also mention that uh, we have a green club at JPL and both Roger and I belong to that green club and Roger is the president. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is native gardens in the Anthropocene. Uh, pretty long word at the end. Uh, Anthropocene is a term coined to describe our current geologic era the time when human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and environment. So both Roger and I have worked on this JPL mission called SMAP. It circles earth 14 times per day and it's a soil moisture mapper. And so it's been monitoring soil moisture levels around earth for six years. And that's important because global warming is drying out soils. Yet global warming affects so much more than just soils because it affects all of us. Seven billion plus people live on earth now, the most ever. 
Everyone's livelihood assumes a stable climate and almost everyone directly or indirectly burns a fossil fuel, that's oil, gas, or coal. So I'll start off by exploring the current state of climate science. Then Roger will tell us how native plants are responding to global warming. And I'll end with a discussion of things we can do to avoid the worst ravages of climate change. Fossil fuel combustion releases carbon dioxide or CO2 into the atmosphere. CO2 emissions from human activities are a hundred times greater than that spewed out by volcanoes, just as a reference. So greenhouse gases like CO2, methane, nitrogen oxide, and even water vapor act like a blanket surrounding earth, trapping heat and causing its surface to warm up. It's the same way that glass traps heat in a greenhouse or in your car. But Earth doesn't have any fast way to reduce that extra heat, like opening a window. So how much trapped heat is there? Well, it's equivalent to exploding 410,000 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs per day, every day of the year. And that's growing in number. Although to you and I, it doesn't feel all that hot. So where's it all going? 96% of it has gone into warming the oceans and melting ice. Only 2% of the heat is warming air, which is what we sense directly. Here's what that 2% of the heat has done to the atmosphere over the past 130 years. The blues are cooler than the 1960s average and the orange and reds are warmer than the 1960s. And you can see pretty clearly here um, the effect that uh, has this uh, warming has had, especially on the northern latitudes. The northern latitudes, as you are well aware, is where there's an awful lot of ice and also a lot of land mass that um, includes permafrost areas, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The 96% of the heat has caused oceans to rise three and a half inches since 1993 or, and about four inches since 1900. Melting glaciers contributed to part of that and the thermal expansion of hotter ocean water is the other major contributor. Where will Pacific Islanders go? The ocean is rising up and over their islands. Sunny day saltwater flooding is happening in Virginia. It's happening in Miami and it's happening on the West Coast too. Here, this is uh, the Embarcadero in San Francisco. So regularly since 2017, during the high king tides that happen every uh, once or twice every month, uh, this plaza floods. I mean, salt water that's coming in regularly. And that's here uh, on the West Coast. And then, um, so here's another example of uh, a West Coast unusual flooding. Uh, sunny day flooding. This is down near San Diego in La Jolla. This is a high tide. And this is salt water coming up the street, right over the beach and into the street. So, so these, are, these are examples. Um, here, uh, even closer uh, to us, Balboa Island down near Newport Beach. Um, you can see this 12 inch wall that this community erected around their entire island. It's, I think you can see it here. It's sort of a different color concrete. I mean, they were having the same problem with, with flooding of their streets during high tides. And so they, they erected this, 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 this new wall. Um, so I don't know how much longer, um, this, this mini wall is going to protect them, but, uh, it's, it's, it's working for the immediate, uh, uh time. So how do we know our climate is changing? Well, if, you know, if we look to the far past, we can use paleoclimatology and there's lots of data sets that show over long periods of time how the climate has changed. We can look at borehole extracts, we can look at cave stalactites and stalagmites, we can look at ice cores, we can look at tree rings, we can look at pollen. 
those tell us changes uh, over a very long period of time. But we're more interested in um, the recent times. That's much more pertinent to us. And this plot shows the growth in carbon pollution over the last 63 years. But because carbon dioxide is invisible, we don't notice it readily. But the level now is higher than human beings have ever lived with. And you can see on the right-hand side, the, num uh, the 417, that's 417 parts per million, way higher than just back in 1957 when it was around 315 and much higher than the uh, what we can call the baseline level, the pre-industrial level of around 270. So we've almost nearly, not quite, doubled uh, numbers since uh, industrialization. So here, this plot shows CO2 levels for the past 320 years, and you can see the rise beginning around the Industrial Revolution. Now, not all of this rise um, is caused by burning fossil fuels. A large part of it is, but much, some of it is also caused by land use change, clearing lots of forests, um, burning down the trees. This third graph shows CO2 levels over the last 800,000 years. 300 parts per million of CO2 level, this, uh, this, this dotted line here. Okay, it was the highest level ever achieved uh, or the, uh, in the atmosphere during the entire evolutionary existence of Homo sapiens and even our predecessors, those primitive cavemen, the Neanderthals. Okay, until, so that's the highest and it's been much lower most of the time. You can see over on the far right, the, um, that rapid spike, which is really instantaneous on, on this uh, time scale. CO2 concentrations and temperature directly correlate, as you can see with these two plots. So, so, you know, the CO2 levels are going up, as I've just pointed out. And here, this is temperature um, going up over that same uh, period of time. And it sort of matches it in pretty closely. Today, the global mean temperature is between 1 and 1.2 degrees Celsius over the pre-industrial baseline. And that's about 1.8 to 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And remember, since we're mostly a water planet, those mean average temperature increases apply, you know, they're averaged over the entire planet. That average uh, increase will be much, much higher over the land areas. And by adding fossil fuel consumption, you can see that that also tracks with the CO2 and temperature. So here's temperature down here, here's CO2 concentrations, and here is fossil fuel consumption um, around the world since 1900. So they're all going up in lockstep. A demonstration of scientific consensus on the reality of global warming. So these are uh, independent measurements from meteorological organizations all around the world, um, all, all measuring uh, temperatures and doing their own analyses. And you can see that they all track each other very, very closely. So there's, uh, without a doubt, um, our atmosphere and planet is increasing in um, heat content. How are biogeographic areas holding up under this assault? Well, the tropics, they've been, over the last two or three decades, they've been expanding 30 miles per decade. Um, the Sahara Desert has increased in area 10% uh, in the last century. Uh, uh, permafrost areas, that's those vast frozen lands in the northern latitudes, they've been moving 40 miles, uh, 80 miles to the north over the last couple of decades. And um, just another example, the wheat belt has increased uh, 160 miles per decade in area. So the weather patterns we see now are consistent with a steady march towards a hotter world. The UN's 2018 report said we have until 2030 to get our emissions under control. So 
a recent fire in our own backyard, uh, the Bobcat fire. Last year, 4 million acres burned in California, the most ever. So those are, those, those are, those are uh, uh, phenomena and, and observations of events. But what about some data? What about some local data? Well, here are the number of extreme heat days in Pasadena in the past four years. And that, that just happens to be where, where I live. These observations exceed the climate model predictions that were made back uh, at, at the turn of the, the century. So an extreme heat day is just a day defined by meteorologists to be one where the high exceeds 95, exceeds or equals 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the usual number in Pasadena of uh, days like that are six. So um, not very common, but, uh, but they do occur. So that people, not an, uh, an unusual event, but uh, just look at how many more of them have been occurring in the past four years. In 2017, there were 35 days of extreme heat. In 2018, 25 days with an all time high of 113 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2019, there were 27 days like that. And in 2020, last year, 52 days of extreme heat with a new all time high in Pasadena of 114 degrees. So back in 2018, during that, that heat wave, um, the West Hills out in the San Fernando Valley reached 117 degrees. And then last year, um, 121 uh, out in the valley, an all time record high. So let's talk for a moment about the economics of climate damage. The number of large weather disasters in the US has gone way up in the last 40 years. And damage costs have also increased. In recent times, at least 15 so-called billion dollar events have occurred each year. That's way more than what we were uh, experiencing back in the 80s, which was around three or four uh, like those uh, per year. And this is all in constant 2018 dollars. So those, those, those 15 events per year, that's coming out uh, costing Americans approximately $910 for every man and woman. So we're starting to talk about real money. The growing seasons are getting longer, of course, due to the more frost-free days, um, which, which, sounds like, which sounds good. But there, that's a double-edged sword because the number of days with extreme heat have also increased as have the number of drought days. How will that affect food security? Food scarcity is a real threat in a few decades in many parts of the world. Economic damage from global warming are projected to be large according to multiple reports. So there's, there's, you know, it looks like we could lose, you know, percentages of GDP for each degree of Celsius warming. And this is the title from a paper published just this month in Nature. It, it looks like human induced climate change is hindering improvements in agricultural productivity. It took civilization hundreds of years to get here. And along the way to make room for us and our domestic animals, we've eliminated many of the wild animals and plants we share earth with. Of all the mammals left on earth, 96% are livestock and us. Only 4% are wild mammals by mass. Our growth spurt is degrading the biosphere. The number of expected extinctions due to natural processes is shown here in the, the blue bars, these, these, these low uh, little risers. And you can compare that to the actual losses that we're observing under the, um, now under human influence. Those are the larger red bars. Although it's in our own best interests to preserve a healthy biosphere. 
For example, that's where the oxygen we breathe comes from. We need a new attitude. We need to honor Earth's remaining biodiversity and to take it seriously. So what does the future hold? So the UN wants nations to limit worldwide heating to less than 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 1.5 degrees Celsius, above the pre-industrial levels. That's equivalent to what's called their very optimistic emissions pathway. So these are their four pathways that the UN has identified. They call them very optimistic, and this is very optimistic with respect to human behavior or human action. Very op there's very optimistic, optimistic, pessimistic, and very pessimistic. The numbers with those, um, there, there's a very uh, rigorous definition of where these numbers come from, but a much easier, uh, I guess, way to remember and to think of these is this, these numbers represent very closely, not exactly, the, they represent the number of degrees rise um, in the mean earth temperature in, in the year uh, 2100 in degrees Fahrenheit with, with respect to the industrial uh, pre-industrial level. So this very optimistic um, pathway, 2.6 degree Fahrenheit rise uh, by 2100, and that's considered very optimistic. So let's just take a very quick look at this. So it, this very optimistic pa pathway it, that'll hold us to about a 2.6 degree or 1.5 degree Celsius rise. We have to eliminate 50% of our CO2 emissions by 2030, all countries, and then continue that trend down, that, 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 you know, that, that, that slope all the way until we reach uh, net zero. If we follow the optimistic pathway, we're looking at it eliminating 50% of all emissions by 2050 and then continuing the slope down, of course, as fast as possible. That'll just be, quote, only a 4.5 degree rise by 2100. 50% uh, of emissions by 20, eliminating 50% by 2070. That's a pessimistic um, outlook or maybe getting closer to uh, where uh, what's called the um, business as usual outlook the status quo. This is where we um, expect to see an 8.5 to 9 degree Fahrenheit rise uh, with respect to the pre-industrial levels by the year 2100. So here's another gauge of how we're doing, what, how, compared to what the predictions were, have been. In 1990, climate scientists predicted this range over here of sea level rise by the year 2015. You can see where this, this double arrowed black line is. But that's not what has been observed. The observations are showing that sea level rise is happening much, much faster. So according to this data, at least, it's still full steam ahead with the business as usual scenario. This is what sea level rise looks like with three and a half degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Um, so in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So this is midway between the very optimistic and the optimistic scenario. And this is what it looks like with a seven degree rise. And this is halfway between the pessimistic and the very pessimistic. I mean, this is uh, looking increasingly likely unless we really take a lot of action like we're, we're hearing from, from uh, the administration net right now. But in this particular scenario, the, the entire port of Los Angeles is, will be completely submerged. On the world's current warming trajectory, in another 70 years, heat wave highs in Los Angeles will reach 150 degrees. It'll be like living inside a sauna. It'll be too hot to work outside. Laborers, farm workers, and gardeners will be unable to because the body just won't function at those temperatures. Even more frightening, in, in my opinion, is that higher temperatures don't have to rise to 150 to harm you. Just two degrees higher ambient temperatures will shave years off of lifespans because all else equal, higher temperatures speed up life's metabolic chemistry. Now that's a two degrees outside temperature, 
that's assuming that we're outside all the time, of course, but that's, that is what the weather brings. There are other climate pressures too. Climate lag provides an additional degree of warming no matter what we do. Climate lag is just what it sounds like. The time that it takes for our actions to reveal themselves in the response of Earth's climate. Some bad outcomes are already baked in at this point. Okay, this is kind of busy graph. I don't want uh, to lose you on this, but what it shows here is that if, if we just sometime in the next hundred years, if we peak CO2 emissions, we don't yet know when that'll be, but if we peak them someplace like this, this shows that uh, the models all show that this red line, which is the temperature, it will continue to rise for some time after we peak those emissions and it will keep going and there will be a slow rise for a very long time. That's what's meant by climate lag. Additionally, other interdependent systems will be thrown into overdrive by global warming if we don't act soon. These are called feedback loops, one condition reinforcing another over and over. Sometimes this is referred to as a vicious cycle. Feedback loops lead to tipping points. Imagine tipping points in ecosystems all over the world, interacting with and reinforcing one another and becoming a cascade. As you can see, there are many possible tipping points. I'll point out just a few. There's the permafrost melt. A quarter of the Northern Hemisphere's landmass is permafrost. These areas are old swamps frozen for thousands of years and they store methane. That's just old rotting vegetation that's thawing. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas with a global warming potential 84 times that of carbon dioxide. When permafrost thaws, vast amounts of methane are released, leading to more warming. At some point, all our efforts to reduce CO2 emissions will be pointless because by then, methane-induced heating will dominate. A new permafrost melt lake. A methane eruption crater in Siberia. This quote is from a paper in Nature. The global warming triggered by massive releases of carbon dioxide may be catastrophic but the subsequent release of permafrost methane may be apocalyptic. Here's another tipping point on the right-hand side. You can see this sharp downward slope of this, this red line that's showing that the uh, Arctic sea ice is melting rapidly over the last uh, 20, 25 years. And of course, ice reflects sunlight, keeps us cool. Uh, ocean water is darker and absorbs much more heat. So as that ice melts, uh, more heat will be absorbed. Um, the discharge of ice, of, of fresh water from Greenland has increased 700% since the 1990s. The boreal forests, these are the high altitude and the high latitude forests. There's 96 million acres of beetle kill across North America. And that contributes in, in the boreal forests, that contributes to a feedback loop that goes like this. Drought and high temperatures make wildfires more likely. Wildfires pump carbon into the atmosphere. That carbon pushes global warming, which makes more droughts and higher temperatures, then more fires. Not something we really want to uh, experience. And then the same sort of cycle can happen in the Amazon basin. We're seeing ever increasing drought and fire there. Some Amazon scientists, scientists that study the Amazon are suggesting there could be a permanent collapse there by 2035. And that would lead just to a vast area, uh, just probably a savanna like area. So there is a strong scientific consensus that Earth is warming. Almost all climate scientists are in agreement that it is human induced. Uh, activities that is causing this warming. In fact, 
We are more sure that greenhouse gases cause climate change than we are that smoking causes cancer. <laughs> and on that rather discouraging note, let's now talk about California flora. So yeah, um, wanting to shift gears here, uh, in the face of this the really absolutely frightening overall picture, um, we have wonderful plants in, in California uh, that, uh, uh, and, and I want to show you some of the, the authentic beauty of our native flora and, and con the connections with the ecosystem and uh, how the changing climate, climate affects those uh, ecosystems. Our biodiversity here is, is greater than any comparable sized uh, land area in the, in the North America. California is more diver biodiverse than any other part of the country. Here's a shot of the, uh, um, uh, one of the canyons in the San Gabriel Mountains. We have ca uh, California, uh, the Coast Live Oak, which you saw earlier, um, um, Aaron uh, was talking about. Um, here are some oaks that survived the station fire. Um, they're fire resilient, fire adapted, um, and a, a wonderful mosaic of other native plants in our habitats. Our, our landscapes are beautiful mosaics. Uh, and again, showing some of the beauty. Our plants are tough as well. Uh, in this year where we have had less than one half of our average uh, rainfall in the Los Angeles area, uh, here are two different kinds of California lilac in the Verdugo Hills just blooming their hearts out. Um, our flora is wonderful, it's beautiful, it's diverse. And we can, in our gardens, bring that, uh, in the gardens, the land that we tend, we can bring that beauty to our cultivated spaces. Here's woolly blue curls on the left, uh, which is primarily pollinated by hummingbirds. And you'll see another picture of that in a few slides. And uh, scarlet larkspur on the right, uh, which is also another hummingbird pollinator. So in addition to our, our, our native plants being beautiful and having an authentic beauty that is climate resilient, one of the things that I really appreciate about native plants is how connected they are with the rest of the ecosystem. Native uh, food chains on land, terrestrial food chains, in, most, in many, many cases depend on insects. When you have insects, you have lizards, you have birds, and you have other things that, that go up the food chain. Insects tend to be very specific as to what plants they will eat. Uh, on the top left here, you see a monarch butterfly. The adult can nectar on many different flowers, but as you're probably well aware, the caterpillars can only eat milkweed plants. There are many such very close relationships between the insects and the plants. So when you plant the native plants in your garden, you will have more insects and you will have life in your garden. You will have birds, you have um, um, birds, you have lizards, the garden comes alive. All of these pictures here are from uh, the Sunland Welcome Nature Garden. It's a community native plant garden that I have instigated and am the primary caretaker of, and you will see a, a slide later with information about it. Um, yeah, plant it and they will come. Uh, that's one of the things that I find most satisfying about gardening with native plants is the, the fostering of the rest of the whole, whole rest of the ecosystem. And it starts with the plants and moves to the insects. You're on the, on the left and the bottom left and upper right, you'll see the hummingbird pollinating that uh, uh, woolly blue curls. It gets the nectar from the pollen from the throat of the flower and the, the, it moves the pollen around on the top of its head. Um, okay, next slide. So how do native plants um, interact with our climate? Well, our, our, our native flora is very biodiverse. It tends to segregate itself. The, the plants tend to grow in elevational bands. And those elevational bands are based on rainfall and temperature. As you go higher up in elevation, 
the temperatures get cooler, the rainfall uh, gets greater because as, as clouds move up the hill, they drop water. So the farther up the hill you go, the more the wetter it gets, the more water you get when it rains. As our global temperatures rise, these bands are shifting uphill, these bands of habitability for each individual species. And so we are already seeing plants move up the hill. Uh, and the concern is you eventually run up, run out of hill. Uh, so in the next slide, I see, uh, I have witnessed this firsthand. This is a, um, this location is about 11,000 feet in the, uh, in the White Mountains to the east of Bishop where the bristlecone pines live. The bristlecone pines are the oldest single trunked trees on the planet. And uh, what you see in this picture is further out, further up the hill, you have small trees, uh, but no big trees. Closer in, you have the big ones. So you can see here, there's sort of a pattern of trees are moving up the hill. They're establishing themselves at higher elevations this, these trees are slow enough growing that the trees you see farther up the hill may be 100 years old already. So climate change is here and it has already been happening and the plants have responded to it. Um, yeah. So in addition to warming temperatures, moving plants up the hill, global climate patterns will be moving plants poleward. Uh, moving climate zones poleward, and, and you would expect the plants to move along with them. Our Mediterranean climate is a, uh, a, a climate pattern that is found in very particular parts of the globe. Global climate, uh, global air patterns, uh, climate patterns, the, um, there's a concept called Hadley cells in atmospheric circulation, where warm air rises in the tropics it moves poleward due to circulation patterns. And then as it cools, it, the, it, that air falls, the falling air makes a high pressure system that essentially creates the great deserts of the world, the Sahara Desert and the, the Southwestern Desert in the United States. Um, and as those, and, and you can see that the Mediterranean climates are very closely related to those, as those deserts move as those Hadley, Hadley cells grow with warming temperatures, those climate patterns are gonna move poleward and the threat of Mediterranean climates becoming desert is, is very real. Rob showed a few, um, uh, uh, talked a little bit about um, high temperature events, um, extreme heat events that, um, we are having a lot more of them lately than history would indicate. Um, we can support our native gardens um, so that this does not have, or at least so far does not have extreme uh, impacts. What you're seeing in these pictures is the native plant garden that I was talking about, the Sunland Welcome Nature Garden, in the extreme heat event in July of 2018, where we had 113 degrees um, temperature, I did not pay attention to the weather forecast. So this, this heat just came out of nowhere. I had not prepared the garden. Um, and as you can see, plants got burned. On the top left is bigberry manzanita. Next to it is holly leaf cherry. In the middle of the screen is, is scrub oak. And on the far right is toyon. These are all really rock solid plants that nothing bothers them. This heat wave bothered them because they were not prepared for it. We in our gardens can hydrate plants. We can supply supplemental irrigation to give them the water they need to, to, um, to get through these heat waves. The heat wave we had last September, September 2020, where it was even hotter than this heat wave in 2018. Um, I don't have any pictures to show of the garden because I was, on top of things, I watered ahead of the heat wave and the plants did not have any impacts. They did not, did not burn. So this is how we can, by using native plants in our landscapes and 
tending them properly, we can support the ecosystem and support the plants and take the little space of land that we take care of and, and make that a benefit to the ecosystem. Oh. Yes, um, and that's, that's wonderful that we have this, that, that we have that out for the plants, but hydration does depend upon a reliable source of clean water. This source of water here in Juniper Hills, uh, which was a vinyl water tank, was melted by the Bobcat fire. And so that's an example of maybe our reliable sources of water won't always be um, there and available. So here's um, a statement from the magazine Scientific American, just published just a, a couple of weeks ago. They wrote that given the circumstances, Scientific American has agreed with major news outlets worldwide to start using the term climate emergency in its coverage of climate change. You know, it's not like uh, any of this snuck up on anyone. I mean, knowingly, since 1988, we've continued to heat the earth. It took a 15-year-old girl to point out that the emperor is not wearing any clothes. So what exactly is climate denial? Many of us scoff at people that, that uh, are in climate denial, but what is it? Well, this are, is climate denial. A few examples, frivolous flying. Uh, living at sea level, fossil fuel subsidies, buying a gasoline engine car. There's many, many more. Um, constructing uh, buildings of way too much concrete. All of these things are examples of climate denial. Every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters and every choice matters. And yet old ways die hard. The climate is changing, why aren't we? The French teach their students about exponential growth in this way. Imagine a small pond with just a single lily pad on it on April 1st. The lily doubles its numbers every day for a month. Um, and then by the, at the end of the month, this is just part of this scenario, at the end of the month, the entire pond is covered. So nothing at the beginning, all covered at the end. So, Given that scenario, what fraction of the pond do you think is covered on April 21st? Three weeks into the month, almost at the end of the month. Well, I will just jump ahead. I won't wait for any answers here. I'll cut to the chase. So here's, here's a table um, of, of, these, of the increase of area. By day 21, lilies are covering just two tenths of 1% of the pond. But over the next nine days, what happens is nothing short of transformational. You can see here how um, still very small fractions of, of the pond covered. By day 28, a quarter of the pond is covered. Well, that's all right. There's still lots of open water. The next day, day 29, well, 50%, we can still get around. Next day, 100% is covered. Okay. It's all gone, all the open water. So this story reveals a common misunderstanding about trends in nature. One, early on, most people don't recognize trends as exponential. And two, towards the end, it goes very fast. Metaphorically, Earth is the pond and humanity is the lily pads upon it. We assume we can continue growing the economy and population, extracting ever more resources, judging quality of life on consumption, but we will eventually run out of pond. What can we do about it? We need to act as if the truth is real. And we need to act now because the opposite of hope is not despair, it is grief. And no one likes grieving. Surely, whenever it happens to each of us, we want to die without regrets. 
but how do we go about that? Especially if most people have no plan nor any inclination to change. It comes down to sharing your story. Our survival depends on us telling each other our experiences, our anxieties and our hopes. Listening to one another is necessary for us to acquire the wisdom in order to act decisively. And if you conclude that decisive action is necessary, then you need to speak up. Contact your state and federal representative about your concern. And if you're in California, yes, even here in California, where your representatives still want to hear from you. One of the ways of speaking up and getting engaged is to vote at all levels of government. Economists tell us if you want to get rid of something, the fastest way to make it happen is to make it more expensive. Making carbon pollution more expensive or accountable for its environmental costs is what's meant by pricing carbon. Your vote might help this happen. Clean energy will be facilitated with a price on carbon, but we also have to power down and use less energy overall. If we want clean energy, abundant clean energy, we have to use less energy per person. That is key. Our buildings need to undergo deep energy retrofits. Passive house designs use 90% less energy than conventional homes. They don't burn fossil fuels. But maybe you think, would I wanna live in one? Here's a passive house. You can see in uh, here in this window reveals the, the, the thick walls, uh, which is you know, super insulated. But otherwise, this is quite a conventional house in appearance. And this particular house was built with mostly biogenic materials, wood and cellulose, in order to become a carbon sink. We need programs to increase urban and wildland, wildland tree canopies to sequester carbon. We need new agricultural and gardening practices to turn soil into a huge carbon sink. We need to take all of those actions and more because there is no planet B. And uh, that's the end of our presentation. We're happy to take questions. That was intense. That was so sobering. I think I need a drink. Um, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah um, thank you guys so much. <laughs> Robert, if you can please take a, a minute to explain to us what this um, slide is that says there is no planet B. I am not a scientist, but I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about hot and cold water faucets. That's what I see when I see this. <laughs> Uh, Roger, he can take this. Okay. Yeah. What's the the background of this slide is a a visual representation of temperature record over time, um, where the blue the the white is kind of the neutral, the blue is cooler, and the red is warmer. Um, and and each each line then is is a year. And Rob, I I think you know the the time scale here. It's two thousand years. So two thousand years of temperature records. Um, and you can see that on the far right, the more recent years are warmer and very warmer. Um, and, and so that, that this is a way to visualize temperature and how quickly we are warming. And that's the, that's the point of this is that, the, the, you know, most of us have only lived in this warmer period. We don't know, we do not have direct individual experience with really what the, the historical climate has been. Yeah, so to put it in a very kindergarten way, we are in hot water. Literally, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, really, not really a kindergarten way, it's okay. an <laughs> adult yeah. way too. Yeah. Wow, that was a lot of information. And um, we have questions in the chat. Um, 
about the insect ap apocalypse. Um, Roger, would you take a minute to answer that? Someone asked if you've seen less insects in, in the gardens. Yeah, and, and the, the question was, have you seen fewer insects lately? And, and, and yes, but that's a very subjective uh, measure. I do not have hard data. Um, I have heard the term insect apocalypse uh, used recently uh, in the last few years. And it has to do more with when you're driving out and about, how many bugs do you get on your windshield? And I can remember when I was growing up, I grew up in Washington state, we drove down to Southern California to visit family. And I can remember driving through the Southern, the Central Valley and our windshield yeah. was just splattered with bugs. A couple of years ago, I, I drove through the Central Valley, not one bug. Not even so, one? Not even one bug splat on my windshield. And this was in August. It's like, holy crap, where are the insects? That's wow. like a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yes, it's real. People who study it see this. Um, in my native plant garden, the Sunland Welcome Nature Garden, which you see on the, on the, the Facebook page there, um, I still see insects and I'm glad of it. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to looking for glowworms now that we have a little bit of rain. Uh, a question, uh, Roger, about um, California native plants. And now that food scarcity is becoming um, more real for a, a lot of communities, um, but so is toxic soil. Do you know of any um, California native plants that draw toxins from um, the soil? I do not know. I, I, I understand the question. I do not have any, any particular answers. So okay. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't answer that. Not, not a problem. Another question having to do with um, California native plants. You mentioned, you know, the, the bands and altitude. Um, right. um, is going to a more desert-like landscaping a, a wise way to go? Or, or are we changing the landscape when we change our landscape? I would always advocate for landscaping with the plants that are from your local climate zone. So I'm in the San Fernando Valley, I'm you know two miles from Theodore Payne Foundation. And so I am look for my landscaping and, and I, I look to the plants that are native there. So coastal sage scrub, chaparral in the Southern California area, those are the plants that I want to landscape with. And I will try in my my landscaping where I have a little bit of ability to cultivate and offer irrigation to, to uh, support plants in, in, in these heat waves. Um, I look at that as the best way to landscape because then I am supporting all of the insects that really want to be here, that, that, that's their home. I'm providing the food for them. Um, um, so so the, the, comparing that to a desert landscape, if I then, if I try to, to say, oh, the Joshua trees out in Antelope Valley are, are suffering, maybe I should plant some here because we're, we're getting hotter and drier. Uh, th that's of limited value because the, the insects that uh, are associated with the Joshua tree in the Antelope Valley are probably not going to be here on the coastal side of the mountains. Okay. Um, Follow-up question to that was, um, do you know of any studies that are focused on California native plants and how fast they are or are not adapting to climate change? Um, I have not looked for those studies. I'm sure they are there. Um, you should start one. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, that, in that concept, I've, I've heard the term assisted migration um, where people will, in doing restoration projects, or they, they will look at a population of, of a species that is at risk due to climate change, and they will make efforts to establish that population in a further north, you know, a more northerly environment uh, location. Um, I know there are issues with that, and I, I just have heard the term. I have not done research into that myself. Okay. Um, one of the slides had a reference to copper in climate change. And that's a question 
from the Zoom chat. Please explain the reference to copper and climate change denial. It's just, it's, um, it's just the use, uh, um, the extraction um, of more minerals, the ever the ever increasing extraction of, of minerals and other consumables from from Earth. So yes, we still need minerals, but we can perhaps be um, recycling what we have at a at a far higher rate. Okay. Um, for Roger, how did you handle the plants after they had been burned in the heat wave? Um, basically, I didn't do anything that grew out of it eventually. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the manzanitas, uh, most of the leaves got burned at the tips. As the plants grew, they eventually, after another couple of years, they shed those leaves and it was not an issue. Um, the plants with the toyon that had the, the tips burned, they grew side branches and, and recovered. So that next winter, spring season, plants recovered without incident. Okay. Um, from the Zoom chat, please explain the term carbon sink. A carbon sink is the opposite of a, just, just a binary explanation to start, it's the opposite of a carbon source. So when we burn uh, a fossil fuel, that's a source of CO2, carbon emissions. A carbon sink is where we're actually drawing down the carbon dioxide into some uh, some ho holding bin, okay? So in this case, we're sequestering the CO2 from the atmosphere by, uh, through, through biogenic materials, wood. Wood grows, it, it, it absorbs CO2 to make the carbohydrates in the wood to make, grows, grow the tree. And so that is um, drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so if we then use sustainably harvest trees to build houses, then we are actually withdrawing CO2 from the atmosphere if we're not also emitting more CO2, right? We have to balance that. Okay. Um, we have more uh, questions coming in. We're actually thinking about allowing um, participants to ask their, their questions. So while Scott is getting that ready, um, Robert, this is a question for you and the your, or the citizen climate lobby. Are you advocating for use of gray water and um, policy to ban um, turf? Uh, no, the citizens climate lobby doesn't uh, really address that, those, those issues at all. Mm -hmm. Citizens climate lobby is, is a organization that is focused on passing strong climate legislation at the federal level. So, I mean, and anything, that, anything that you can do, any action you can do, like, like implementing gray water measures is, is, is helpful for the climate. And, and I, I encourage that, but this uh, CCL doesn't have any say, doesn't have anything to say about that. So you advocate for the federal level, would you ever consider advocating at the local level? Um, yes, we actually do. We are reaching out to local politicians to explain the the federal legislation. Um, so we do we do reach out at that at that level so that everybody understands what this kind of legislation is that that Citizens Climate Lobby advocates for, which is a fee on carbon, and we also call, we call it a climate income because what what ends up happening to to the average person is you just get money money in the mail or or an etf um eft i mean yes so so you so the the, the the high users of carbon um will everybody is assessed a fee that that's where the money comes from but those people that use more than the average amount um that money will then get distributed back to everybody in the population and people that don't use too much co2 or too much uh, fossil fuels will actually end up um, with a net benefit uh, financially. They will actually make money off of this plan. Okay. And this is a question from YouTube, um, Robert. Um, can Rob talk about the Biden administration's plan to reduce US GHG emissions and encourage other countries in the IPCC to increase their commitments to reduce greenhouse gases? 
Well, that's, that's his, his, his plans are hot that's, off the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a little bigger than my, uh, my, my pay grade. Um, but, but anyways, there, 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 there's, there's so much changing under our feet right now. I mean, they're, they're just, there's a, a, a climate summit right now going on in, uh, at the white house. So, yeah. so, and they're, they're talking about that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm no more of an authority on what Biden, President Biden's plan is than, than anybody else here um, <laughs> on this webinar. Yeah, and another YouTube question. Uh, do you advocate for planting more trees and what type, forest restoration, how? So that's a big question. Yeah, well, that was one of my points is we need to mm -hmm. increase the tree canopy. That, so, so CCL itself, if that was part of the question, doesn't advocate for that uh, specifically. But, but everybody that I know that's actually a member in CCL does advocate for that. I think that's a great idea. So there are bills, there are other bills uh, that have been passed by Congress and that can be passed that will um, emphasize and, and encourage um, intense planting of more trees. I think there's one right now called the, the $2 trillion or $2 trillion tree uh, bill. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Jonah. Jonah, whenever you're ready. Hi, thank you. Um, when you showed the pictures of the three different kinds of houses, the middle house had all kinds of plumbing and wiring in it, but the, the better house didn't have any. What, what happened to it? Uh, <laughs> shall I go back? Well, that's, I mean, the plumbing is still there in a, in a, what I'm calling a passive house, but all of the wiring and all of is, is not, um, the, the wiring in that, in that cartoon being wires to uh, furnaces, um, air conditioning systems, uh, lo lots, of, um, lo lots of individual room heaters perhaps, you know, people trying to in heat individual rooms. So the, again, that was just a cartoon to try and make the point but a, a so-called passive house does not actually need any more heat than a, um, or, or cooling um, than say what is used for a, a hairdryer, right? So about one kilowatt of, of heat. So you can just generate that through an, a small electric heater, like, like a, you know, a, a floor heater, portable floor heater. Thank you. That, and I have one more question. Okay. Is, is growing your own food better for the climate than buying the food from the grocery store? Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't, I, um, so I'm not a ag agricultural scientist, but everything that I've read and, and, and um, think I understand is that if you can grow food in your own backyard, do it to the extent it, it, you can to and but don't grow it and still buy the same amount from the stores you know use it to offset how much you're 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 purchasing um that's more of a, a resiliency action i think there's still there's lots of studies that are in process to see whether the the water use and the efficiency of growing food in the backyard is actually beneficial or not but it certainly is resilient having a source of food in your backyard in case something happens where all the trucks, you know, can't make it through to the stores. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Jonah. You. Thank you so much, Jonah. Um, Roger, this was a question for, for you. Are native plants uh, better, more efficient at um, sequestering carbon? That's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't know specifically, but one of the things I would look at is how much carbon are you spending to grow those plants? Um, it takes carbon to deliver water to your yard. And so if you're growing plants that are very thirsty, it's going to take more carbon to grow them. Um, so that's kind of something to look at in the, the kind of overall equation is how much spending, uh, how much carbon are you incurring to grow these plants and how much carbon are they then sequestering? And I, I don't know, I don't have really good answers on, on native plants and how much carbon they sequester. It really, it probably depends on what plants you grow. Um, oak trees, sycamore trees will sequester different amounts of carbon than say a buckwheat bush or sagebrush. Um, so I, it, that would be a very complicated question to answer specifically, directly. 
Uh, we had a question about the irrigation that you used at the Sunland Garden. You answered it in chat, but will yes. you answer it out loud, please? Sure, happily. Mm -hmm. um, that particular garden um, already, at the time that we took it over, it had a regular installed kind of pop-up uh, rainbird type irrigation system. And so we essentially are using the same system as, as was already there. And it's a, it's a standard garden system, garden irrigation. Um, and the concept I employ in the timing of the irrigation is to give the garden with irrigation somewhere around a quarter inch of precipitation um, every time I water. And I typically water somewhere between like every four weeks or so. Okay, we have, uh, thank you for that, uh, Roger. We have another question from YouTube. Um, how is California doing in curbing its greenhouse gases? We hear a lot about California as a climate leader. Are our leaders able to turn their goals into actual past legislation? That sounds like a question for Mr. Hall. <laughs> well, how's, so how's California doing on its, um, we, we have, California is doing really well at transitioning to clean energy. So there is a, 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 a ramp to follow to generate more and more of our electricity from clean energy. So that's, that's sort of on track with the plan to go completely net zero as far as generating energy by 2050. But, um, it, it's, but as for, so, so it's a double-edged sword, right? We're generating more energy cleanly but we are not generating less fossil fuel energy in a, in a significant sense yet. So overall, what that means is that we're just using much more energy than we have. I mean, we're, this, is, this is this business as usual scenario. We're continuing to use more energy, a lot more clean energy, but there's a lot, we're still continuing to pump oil and use a lot of gas. So we need, uh, um, the largest single use of, of fossil fuels right now in California is our transportation networks, our cars. Um, and so that's why we really need to have a fast transition off of automobiles to, um, to, to electric vehicles and, and, and other forms of transportation. I mean, quite honestly, what we don't, we really don't need more cars on the road, um, whether they're electric vehicles or not, but um, if you really need to have a car, then you should be getting an electric vehicle. Yeah, um, electric vehicles are coming down in price, but how can someone that is not um, middle class or upper, upper middle class, how can, you know, just regular everyday folks do things to uh, mitigate this climate crisis? You know, if we don't own homes, how can we tend a garden that sequesters um, carbon, how can we grow our own food? What is it that all of us can, can, can do to, to not make things worse? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very, very good question. And um, essentially what, what you're sort of saying, or, or what, what, what this whole idea is alluding to is that we can buy our way out of climate change. And, and in fact, we can't. So um, I think in the short, so, so we're going to have to elect officials that understand the, the, the real issue so that policy can be implemented that will then rep, be representative of all those people that, that, you, that um, you were just mentioning. So in the, in the meantime, I think the single most important thing for people to do is to speak up and get involved. Join some organization that um, is, represents your, your values in, in this area. In, perhaps the, the climate emergency and have the, and, and use them as a megaphone to get your ideas in front of our elected officials. Because what we do need is we need to have a big ramp, a big um, rapid increase in say rapid transit. So we, don't, we can't afford electric vehicles, then what we need are um, electric rapid transit systems. And we need perhaps lots of, um, lots of electric Uber automatic or, you know, driverless Uber vehicles that we can call and summon at will. I mean, those would be options, but we're still just on the drawing board with all of those plans. Yeah, we had a question 
from Kimberly. Kimberly, you're like, I think the one that's joining us from as far away as Northern um, California. You had a question for Roger. Um, could you elaborate why you chose native plants over cultivars? Ah, um, the, the native, well, there are cultivated varieties of native plants. So, so that's for the Sunland Welcome Nature Garden, what my inspiration for the garden was to choose those plants specifically that are local to the area. So I, I basically went out on some of the local trails um, and with permission, some of, with permission of the landowner, uh, collected seeds and cuttings and grew those plants for the garden. So essentially both the species of plants and the genetics of the plants are local to the area. And I felt that that was the best, uh, you know, uh, the best plants to use in landscaping are essentially those that would have been there uh, had the area not been developed. Um, there are places where you need a plant to be a particular size or shape and for that, you would want to use the cultivated variety that has those characteristics. But for the majority of this garden landscaping, I, I, I'm, I'm wanting it essentially to be a, um, a representation of the plants in the area. And so genetically as well, I value that diversity. Um, it's kind of a value judgment, but that's the point of that, that garden is to showcase the local flora. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you want to talk about our local seed initiative? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So our uh, seed department, um, Jenny Arnold, um, has been really leading this effort um, with a number of other groups across Los Angeles, um, and it's called Local Source Initiative. And so what they've done is that they have gotten um, secured permission from um, our state parks, uh, our, our various different local parks uh, to get permits to go in and collect seed. So uh, that seed we then grow out um, and we harvest the seed. We keep some of it in our freezers out in, you've been to visit us out in Sun Valley in our little yellow horticulture building. There are all of these freezers and they are storing the genetic diversity of the Los Angeles <laughs> basin. It's pretty cool. Um, and so uh, we're able to grow that seed. If you go to the nursery, you'll also see, usually there's purple or orange tags on all the plants. If you look out for the purple tags, those plants are all grown um, out as part of that project. So you can get, you know, um, a, a monkey flower that is, you know, it's, uh, that seed is genetic, its genetics come from say the Verdugo Hills. Um, so really, really local genetic material. And that means they are even more adapted <laughs> to your site, uh, climate, weather, soil. Um, and so, uh, and, and then the um, part of that partnership too is that in the case of fire, um, California native plants in um, most cases will come back on their own. They're incredible. They uh, can re-sprout. Some plants um, are fire adapted where their, um, their seeds actually sit in the soil banks waiting for a fire to come through. So their germination cue is actually smoke or heat or charred wood. Um, and so the fire actually contributes to the diversity of plant species we have here, which is amazing. However, the frequency of fires is just going up and up and up. And uh, in some areas, plants don't have um, a chance to recover. So let's say there's normally a fire every 100 years, and now there's a fire every five years. Um, that leads to what they call type conversion, where um, invasive species are taking over those areas. And in those cases, restoration is necessary. So we're... <laughs> Sorry, I see your hand. I'm like, I can go on and on, you guys. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Aaron spends hours a day looking at fire things. <laughs> okay, very excited. I, I have two comments to make. One, one with respect to what Aaron just said, and another one as a follow-on to, to what I was saying before. Um, about 
what's your phone? Oh, shoot, now I forgot what I was going to say to Aaron. Aaron's. <laughs> oh, oh, type conversion to fire frequency. Yeah. Um, manzanita is an example of a plant. Most of the 50 some odd species of manzanita in California are uh, obligate reseeders, meaning that the, the fire kills the parent plant, but the seeds require fire to germinate. Yeah. Manzanitas typically take at least a decade, if not two decades, to even start producing seeds. And so if you have a fire before you have enough seeds produced and out in the environment to have that next generation, you know, if you have a fire too soon, you've just lost essentially that, that plant from that area. Uh, and I've witnessed this firsthand, well, I've witnessed the I've been watching in the station fire burn zone, uh, Big Berry Manzanita mm. with sprouted after the fire. And just last year, which was essentially the 10th year after the fire, I saw some evidence of some Big Berry Manzanita having flowered and set seed. Oh, wow. That's, that's good to hear. And, but that's not really all good of them. Hear. Not all of them. Some big berry mans yeah. and fact, a lot of the big berry mans needed that I see in the station of fire area have not yet bloomed. Wow. So this is 10 and change years into their growth and they still have not yet bloomed. So we, they are still incredibly vulnerable in that area. Wow. So, One um, other just quick thing I'll toss out about that is that um, California Native Plant Society is doing a really cool citizen science project with fire followers and so they're on their website, they're listing the burn sites. And so if you go hiking there and you can snap photos of the plants that are coming back and reemerging and add it to the iNaturalist app under their research program, um, it's a really helpful way to help scientists and just firsthand experience of uh, our ecology, you know, this fire ecology that we live yeah. right here so okay yeah. I'll, I'll stop talking about fire <laughs> no it's a hot then, subject we love it <laughs> <laughs> the other comment i want to make is, is is pertaining to the uh the cultivated variety versus uh open open pollinated by seed uh plants and that is insects and particularly butterflies know the difference they will actually uh you know go from flower to flower and they're, they're kind of tasting it and they, they really only pay attention to the, the flowers that taste different. So they essentially are, are pollinating for biodiversity. Um, and I, I had read a couple of articles on this topic and then went to the, what was Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden is now California Botanic Garden in Claremont. And I was walking around the garden and fully enjoyed the garden uh, in the, the different habitat areas, I was kind of, it, it was an, a nice day in April and, and the birds were all chirping, the, the, the garden was alive. And then I walked into the cultivar garden and suddenly the noise was more distant. It's like, here's a garden specifically of California native plants, but cultivated varieties that you would think you would want to more use in your landscape because they're more, um, you know, their specific size or shape or, or whatever. Um, and, and the wildlife wasn't there. Wow. I would and think that, that if I really was powerful, sorry. Yeah. I think that if I was a bee, I would want real butter and not margarine, Right. you know? <laughs> yeah. I'd be the well, fattest bee out there, but I'd be happy. It, it's, it's more like if it's, it's five different butters to choose from, you're going to enjoy going from one to the next to the next because yeah. they're different. And the variety is what you crave. Mm -hmm. If every single butter tastes exactly the same, it's going to be boring. And I think that's, that's a factor at play in pollinator activity. And so in one or two, you know, garden yards uh, where you have a diversity of plants anyway, it's probably not a big deal. But if you have a, a, a larger landscape where you have a row of the same thing, well, that does not confer the same pollinator benefit to, if it's a cultivated variety, so they are all genetically identical, then if you had a bunch of seed grown plants of, of the same species. Okay. Um, this is a question from YouTube from Robert Bailey. Um, we live in a highly developed area, so how can we find and plant? 
the varieties that would have been here had the area not been developed. Um, go to Theodore Payne. <laughs> also, there is a website called uh, on CalFlora, calflora.org has a, a place in their website called What Grows Here. And that's that's a really good resource. You, you, you know, type in your type in your zip code yeah. and you know what are the species of plants that grow here? And does, and, does Cal Flora require a subscription? No, no, okay. it is free. Calflora.org. Okay. Um, and this is something that came up in chat when we were talking about um, Greta. And um, someone said, was it Sander said, um, traditional people, indigenous people have been advocating um, for for years, and I, I responded, yeah, you know, join us in June when we talk about cultural burns. And Sander responded, oh, I didn't mean it to be a burn, etc. Et and I said, no, not that kind of a burn, <laughs> a cultural burn, where we, we formerly known as prescribed burns. Um, so I just gave everyone here, you know, the heads up in June, we will be talking about prescribed burns, traditional environmental knowledge, and, you know, the ongoing climate crisis and climate justice. So come back um, for June um, on that one in uh, May next month, we will be talking about California native bees. The link is up on our Eventbrite and just wonderful pictures. Um, with Crystal, and you can follow her on at BSIP on Instagram. So um, in our chat, we, um, we have calflora.org and also calscape.org. Um, I, I think that's all we had for the questions. Thank you, panelists, um, Robert and Roger and Scott and Aaron. Um, one of the questions that we didn't uh, address yet was favorite California native plant and why? <laughs> I think my Calif my favorite California native plant is California buckwheat, Eriogonum fasciculatum. It's small enough to be used in pretty, pretty much most landscapes have a space you could put a California buckwheat. Um, and it, it's not real, well, it's not showy like a, like a manzanita or a ceanothus, but if you think about it, it blooms over a long period of time. It, it starts, historically, it starts blooming in, in May and it continues blooming on it to November. And if you give it a little bit of water, I have it blooming all year round at the garden. So it, and, wow. and it, it attracts, it supports a variety of pollinators, you know, you name it, butterflies love it. Bees that love it. rust color for in fall is amazing. Yes, and the seasonal change. We have seasons here. Hello. Yes. Um, you know the the the, the uh, creamy white of the flowers fading to the rust of the of the the seed heads, and then maybe in the middle of winter you get a little bit of solid green because you've had some rain. Mm -hmm. Robert, and it's tough as nails. It's tough it as nails. It's so it's a tough. plant. Yeah. I get. I would. I would go with mountain cranberry. Um, I think that's the proper name or the, the proper uh, familiar name. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and no real reason. I just um, I just like that plant, and I've I've transplanted it a few times. So, <laughs> Roger could probably give you a long a long explanation of why it's a it's a good one, but I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Aaron. Oh, I have to go. Well, we can, you know, let's just ask Scott because he never says anything. Scott. <laughs> he says no. He's muted, so Scott? we can't hear him anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, there was a question about how do you avoid daughter on your buckwheat? Um, oh. I, uh, interesting. Do you have question. to? Do you have to avoid daughter on your buckwheat? You don't I have mean, to, no. Yeah. Um, I suppose if I, I have not had it, I have not had daughter show up at the welcome garden. I'm kind of surprised actually, because there's buckwheat adjacent to it and there's daughter in the area. So, but I th isn't daughter one of those where the seed goes in the ground and it needs that fire to come back? No, oh, no, 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 no. Daughter is, is, doesn't care about fire. Um, okay. It will germinate whenever. And all it does is it, 
the, the seed germinates, it, 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 the cert seed germinates in the soil. Uh, the, the seedling comes up and it finds a host plant and it wraps around it. And then it, the, the root just withers and it just crawls its way, you know, wraps its way around the host plant yeah. and, and gets all this nutrition from the yeah. host. So it's not a friend to the host plant. Um, but it's not going to kill it. It's not a parasitoid. It is a parasite. It no, para a par parasitoid. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I would say if I have, if I have daughter and I didn't like it, I would trim, trim it out. Yeah. <laughs> but it has pretty little flowers on it. It has use. It does. Yeah. It yeah. Does. It is interesting. Uh, so, okay. We are at the seven o'clock mark. Thank you everyone for joining us. Please join us again next month when we talk about bees. I will leave you with my favorite California native plant, which is guatamote, also known as mule fat, because when I smell that, I know that there's water. Um, and so thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. We'll see you at the welcome, the welcome garden. Is that the official yep. name? Sunland Welcome Nature Sunland Garden. Welcome Nature Garden. Yep. I can't right believe off. I have not been yeah. there before. <laughs> it's right Thanks off the guys. freeway. You drive Thanks right in. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.